All right, guys, so today I want to talk about something that I struggle with daily, and it's probably something that you struggle with too, and it has so many facets to it, and I'm talking about self-control. And as we know, self-control, it can entail a lot of things. It can mean that you're struggling with maybe controlling your actions, maybe your anxiety, uh, maybe it's some addictions or anger. Maybe you're just trying to control your circumstances at times that you're pretty much out of your control. We uh, struggle with depression sometimes. Even with our eating, I think I'm guilty of that too. <laughs> our fears, um, we sometimes let our fears get the, the best of us. Our feelings, you know, we also worry about our futures, what's gonna happen. We try to control our level of happiness. Sometimes it's even out of our hands. Jealousy, envy, pride, sexual desires. This is for my wife, our spending. <laughs> she has trouble with that. Controlling our tongues. Wow, that's, that's really hard. And lastly, but it's not a all in the list, our thoughts. How many can relate to any of these things and have trouble with that? Yeah? Amen. Amen. So this is what we're going to get into. So what is self-control? I guess if we go to the dictionary, it's defined as the ability to control oneself and in particular one's emotions, our desires, or the expression of them, especially in difficult situations. And it's to regulate one's thoughts, emotions, in the face of temptations or impulses. Ouch. This message is hurting already, amen? Who can honestly say that they practice good self-control in any area of their lives? We try, right? We try. Why is it so hard? Why is it such a battle? The flesh. The flesh. Yes. The flesh. Paul talked about that the battle is not flesh and blood. And when you think about it, before when I read that verse, I used to say, well, the enemy to me is like the Taliban, you know? You know, people that are trying to invade here and try to take away Christianity and they're trying to bomb us. That to me was the enemy. But when you look at it in the context spiritually, Anger, fear, lust, envy, jealousy. That's really what's attacking our spirituality. Amen? And if you just look at the word within itself, self-control. We think it's all about us. Me, myself, and I. We take it as selfishness, self-centeredness. You know? It's all about us. We like to drive, we like to take the wheel, but yet we are so out of control. Yeah. You know, we try to manage saying, well, maybe I just need to work on my self-discipline. Or if you read the worldly books, they'll talk about willpower. Has anybody tried that? Does it even work? No. So what works? Okay. Amen. I know we have several guys here that have struggled or still struggle with addictions, with drugs. And how many could honestly say, you know what, I could just quit cold turkey. It's just up to me. How many have fed into that lie? Yeah. We think that by developing, you know, that just say no attitude. How many remember the D.A.R.E. program going up? The drug abuse resistance education. And I would say, just say no, you know, that's enough. Yeah, right. I guess the person that said that was never really into a peer pressure or any of these other things, right? But the point I'm trying to make here is uh, the answer, it's not within ourselves. It comes from up above. And I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. 
they've interviewed a top level CIA operatives and they asked them, what was the most diabolical evil invention ever made by man? Can you even take a guess? Close to it. Yes. What else? Maybe, maybe somebody can say, well, maybe it's the atomic bomb or the gun. That you're close, Julian. They actually will shock you. It's in the majority of people's homes. The TV. That's right, the TV. Even people that are indigent and poor, and, you know, they have a TV. It's a television screen. There's an old movie called The Running Man with Donald Schwarzenegger. Has anybody seen that movie? Yes. There's a famous line, and it's so true. And it's one of the villains, and he says, this is television. That's all it is. It has nothing to do with people. It has nothing to do with ratings. For 50 years, we've told them what to eat, what to drink, what to wear. For Christ's sake, don't you understand? Americans love television. They wean their kids on it. Listen, they love game shows. They love wrestling. They love sports and violence. So what do we do? We give them what they want. We're number one, Ben. That's all that counts. Believe me, I've been in the business for 30 years. And as we know, this box has spewed so many lies to us and it really has tainted and contorted and distorted our image of who we really are. All these companies, they spend billions of dollars a year in advertising and it's not for nothing. They want us to buy in to what they're selling. And as a result, some of us, we sell out. We drink the Kool-Aid and we fall into these lies. And I didn't want to share this, but I don't think God's going to let me get away with it. Because this sermon is about me. It's preached to me first, self-control. And when my wife and I got married, I had a lot of baggage, both emotional and psychological. And she wasn't aware of it at the time. And that addiction was to pornography. And much like you guys that have an addiction, I was, you know, deceived, thinking, you know what, I can, you know, stop. I can quit. But it wasn't the case. It was those things that were just polluting my spirit. And it's been said that the eyes are the window to the soul. So I was literally feeding my soul with all these images, all these things in my spirit. And needless to say, it brought great strain in our marriage. I mean, she doesn't like to talk about it, but I can just imagine what she was thinking like. Am I not good enough if I'm not satisfying him? Am I not pretty enough? In other words, notice how sin has a great domino effect in your life. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. But what I want to get to is basically the reason it was so hard to break these shackles can be summarized in one statement. That my desire to please myself was stronger than my desire to please God. My desire to please myself was stronger than my desire to please God. And our first lady shared this scripture to the board this past week and I thought it was right on. It's in 1 John 2.16 and it reads, For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. Who's the God of this world? That's right. The world tells us that money possessions, social standing, educations, 
equal what? Power. These things give us the illusion of being in control until we stop to consider just how fleeting they are. Are we going to take any of that when we pass away? No. Not even our fortunes. They, they're going to weather somebody else in Arizona and spends them. I mean, it's it's worthless pretty much. It's counted as garbage. And I just want to paint a picture in our heads of what self-control, what does it entail? What does it mean in our lives? And this scripture is in Proverbs 25, 28. And it says, a person without self-control is like a city with broken walls. A person without self-control is like a city with broken walls. If you recall the city of Jericho, what made it so powerful and mighty is they had a huge wall surrounding the entire perimeter of the city. And what was the purpose of that wall? It was to keep the enemy, the invaders, out. So when you don't have self-control, guess what? It's like a wrecking ball hitting your wall. And it keeps on hitting until guess what? It's going to break open. And what's going to go in? Sin. After sin. After sin. In football, if you don't have a good offensive line, what happens? That's right. You set the quarterback. You lose yardage. And guess what? You end up losing. David provides with an example on how this played out in his life. Self-control or lack thereof. He was on the roof of his palace and he saw this beautiful woman baby. And he couldn't look away. <laughs> So his first sin was lust. And that lust, it didn't go away, it festered. So what did it turn into? Fornication and adultery. And what did that turn into? Murder. That's right. So you see how there's stages <laughs> of just one thing after another after another before you know it. Man, you're way deep inside. It's dangerous. I think for a lot of men, we can honestly agree that our weakest spot is in between our legs. And I think this uh, men's conference that's uh, coming up, it's, it's really time, you guys, because we need to hear a word like this. We need to be held accountable for what we should be doing. And we need to get restored back to our rightful place in God. Amen. So I want to share with you some weapons that I use to overcome my addiction. It helped me to stay in line throughout these years to overcome my struggles in my flesh. And the first one I want to talk about is fasting. How many of you have ever fasted before? How long? One day, two days. Not too long ago, I went seven days fasting. And wow, let me tell you, the first two days are the worst, the hardest. And the uh, mistake that I made was I went three days without water. <laughs> and I remember my wife telling me, you have, you have like kind of a funky smell, but I think that was me I literally dying because my kidneys were pretty much shot. <laughs> and so that's the mistake that I made, but man, you talk about fighting your flesh and you know fighting those natural desires of your body to want to eat, to consume something. It, it's, it's hard, it's, it's so difficult. And I can just imagine Jesus when he went on his 40 day fast and for the devil to just go up to him and you know, tempt them. There's few, uh, a lot of films that, you know, when he tells them, if you are the son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread? And you see the devil literally showing him a loaf of bread. Wow. That's why he was Jesus, because only he could go through that. So, what does fasting do? It denies the natural desire of the flesh. It helps us to practice abstinence, not only with food, but with other things that are spiritually unhealthy to us. 
A man named Ol Helsby once said that the purpose of fasting is to loosen to some degree the ties which bind us to this world of material things and our surroundings as a whole in order that we may concentrate all our spiritual powers upon the unseen and the eternal things. That's very wise. It's one of the greatest spiritual disciplines for seeking God's intervention. And it's also a critical weapon of spiritual warfare and deliverance in our lives. It's a physical exclamation point at the end of our pleas to God. We fast to express our ache for all the implications of Jesus' power in the present moment. And fasting fuels our longing, our hunger for God. That's why Jesus rebuked the devil by saying, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So even though we rely on food for physical substance, God is our spiritual substance. Another tool is prayer. You know, even though uh, Jesus, he was God manifested as man, if you read throughout the scriptures, he was constantly praying. I mean, could you imagine? I mean, it says in the Garden of Gethsemane that he was constantly praying and went back and forth. He was fighting his flesh. And he goes back to the disciples and finds them asleep. And wow, that, that probably even tore his heart even more. And they couldn't even stay away for one hour for him to pray with them. And I imagine Jesus, yes, he was the son of God, but the Bible tells us that he was tempted, just like we were. And he went through the same struggles we did. But he kept praying to the Father many times because he knew that there was no substitute for him. He was in direct communication with his dad. It was his 911, especially when he was getting ready to go to the cross. As we remember, when Jesus was praying to the Father, he said, Move this cup from me, this cup of suffering. But not my will be done, but your will be done, not mine. And there's a key that no matter how we're feeling, that we surrender our wills to God. And it's easier said than done, right? If Jesus was having trouble, what chance do we have, right? <laughs> we give up and we give in too quickly, don't we? I think too often we develop this attitude of, you know, it's ineffective, it doesn't work. You know, we want constant answers and immediate answers. It's like a drive-through style prayer life, right? Yeah. Remember that uh, pizza delivery uh, guarantee of 30 minutes or less? That went away really fast, didn't it? It didn't last too long. <laughs> they couldn't even deliver on that. I think, Lorraine, you mentioned this uh, on Thursday night. You talked about it took, what was it, 13 years to get your uh, relationship reestablished with your daughter? I mean, that's faithfulness, guys. So, wow. For 13 years, praying the same thing over and over, you don't see anything move, anything change. That's faith, guys. Amen. We also say to ourselves, well, God knows everything. So I don't really have to pray about it. If you go back to the scriptures, when we get saved, what do we have to do? We have to utter with our lips and declare as Jesus, as our Lord and our Savior. Why is that? Because words have meaning, they have power. They have influence. It shakes up the spiritual realm, guys, even though we don't really see it. We sometimes sound like a broken record at times because we're like asking for the same thing over and over and over. And we're like, well, God already knows because I've been praying for it like 
a gazillion times, right? There is a scripture that says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. It's our direct communication line to our Father. You know, the excuse that my wife uh, likes to make is she doesn't know how to pray. Well, you don't have to really know how to pray. It just comes from here, whatever's in your heart. I mean, sure, Jesus gave us, you know, the Lord's Prayer as a model, but it doesn't have to be line for line. You know, there's an acronym that's Acts, and that helps me a lot. You know, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And if you include those four, you can't go wrong. And the last and most important one um, is relying and walking in the Spirit. I want you to please turn to your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. And I'll be reading out of the uh, Amplified Version. It says, But I say, walk habitually in the Holy Spirit. Seek Him and be responsive to His guidance. And then you will certainly not carry out the desire of the sinful nature, which responds impulsively without regard for God, and his precepts. For the sinful nature has its desire, which is opposed to the spirit, and the desire of the spirit opposes the sinful nature. For these two, the sinful nature and the spirit, are in direct opposition to each other, continually in conflict, so that you, as believers, do not always do whatever good things you want to do. But if you are guided and led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Look at the life of the Apostle Peter. At one point, he denied Jesus three times. But then after that, there was a turning point. There was something that changed. What was missing? Does anybody know? What was the turning point in Peter's life? The difference maker. Was that the day of Pentecost? When they received the helper that the Lord promised them. Those who are the sons of God are what? Led by the Spirit of God, right? So let's keep reading uh, verse 19. Now the practices of the sinful nature are clearly evident. They are sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, total irresponsibility, lack of self-control, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, and strife, jealousy, fits of anger, disputes, dissensions, and factions that promote hearsays, envy, drunkenness, riotous behavior and other things like these. I warned you beforehand, just as I did previously, and this is Paul speaking, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This passage is it's very sobering because it shows us that that notion of once saved, always saved, it's a sham. It's a lie. I think, Julian, you mentioned this several times in, in some of the uh, messages that you sent me. And that's, there is no salvation without transformation. There is no salvation without transformation. If we're not growing and changing in God, what are we doing? We either stagnant or we're regressing. That's why Jesus warns us that not everybody who calls me Lord, Lord will be saved. They won't enter the kingdom of God. Carnal Christians are not going to make it. 
Why? Because there's not going to be enough evidence to show that they're followers of Christ. You see our walk? It needs to be producing fruit. And just like love, self-control, it's another fruit. And if you keep reading, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the result of His presence with us, is love, unselfish concern for others, joy, which is inner peace, patience, not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting, Amen. kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and lastly, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And I think we heard this verse last Sunday. He stole it from me. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature together with its passions and appetites. That's why Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain, because Paul knew where he was going if he died. Amen? When we receive salvation, we say that we accept Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. What does Lord mean? It's someone having power, authority, and influence. He's a master or a ruler. He should rule our lives. We quickly gloss over and forget that the Lord of our life means that He should be the Lord of our lips and every other aspect of our life. Our mouths, man, they get us into trouble so many times, doesn't it? Stand up, guys. You know what's so ironic about self-control? We try to control the behaviors of others when we can't even control our own. And the perfect example is parents. Yes. <laughs> what happens when they start acting up? Before that, we lose our patience, right? And that impatience turns into what? Anger. And anger turns into what, Stacy? Violence. Chancla. <laughs> The bell, the yeah, anger weapon, of course, is the chancla, right? So it just goes to show how we're so out of control, and yet we're trying to control others. We need to check ourselves first. Amen. So when Jesus said that, apart from me, you can do nothing, did he mean this like in a literal sense that you can't do nothing, period? No. It, he meant that you can't do nothing. That's a spiritual and eternal value. The word tells us that faith, hope, and love last forever. That's what he's talking about. These things that are of eternal importance and significance. The word also tells us that in our weakness, he is strong. And that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. You know, Paul always liked to compare our walk with God as being a runner. You know, running the race of faith, right? You know, as runners, as athletes, they train, they work hard. They also take supplements. You know, vitamins, minerals, proteins, amino acids, among other things. Did you know that we're also supposed to be supplementing our faith? As well. Second Peter 1, 5 through 7 says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection. Brother and love. It's amazing how it always comes back to love. Huh? It's everything. 
we've been learning on how we should be looking at each other through God's eyes, through His lens, and what He sees. But people sometimes forget what does God see in us? What do we see in ourselves? You know, the Bible talks about how our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Are we doing our part in keeping that temple clean and sanitized? I think it's a Chinese proverb that says that cleanliness is next to godliness. My wife, she loves to clean the house, it seems like all day long. <laughs> I'm the real slob of the family. <laughs> She's always picking up after me. But one of Jesus' name is Emmanuel. That means God with us. And through His Spirit, it's God within us. That means that He guides us, that He leads us, and that He directs our path. So I want you guys to think as the Holy Spirit being a filter. The Bible told us that we should be slow to speak and slow to anger. You know why that is? Because anytime we're angry or we're in a situation, our flesh immediately wants to react. But we've got to contain ourselves. We've got to wait for our spirit to discern and to give us that right response that should be in love. I always tell my wife, you know, count to ten, but she's like, that ain't working. He tells us constantly, wait on the Lord. Because when we practice restraint, the Spirit is released. And if we do this, self-control transforms to spirit control. And lastly, Remember that the Word of God is our sword, our weapon for battle. So let's read it, meditate it, live it, and use it. Be careful what you feed yourself and who you surround yourself with. If your friends aren't helping you to glorify God, then they are hindering you. You need to cut them off. And if you forget pretty much everything that I said today, I want you to keep these words of the song that we heard earlier by Elevation Worship in mind, especially when you feel like you're losing control. It said, I need you to soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life. Give me faith to trust in what you say. That you're good and that your love is great. I'm broken inside and give you my life. I need you to pierce through the dark and cleanse every part of me. Because I may be weak but your spirit is strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. And he ends it with, all I am, I surrender. You see, God doesn't want us to be successful. He wants us to be surrendered Amen. to him. To get rid of the things that separate you from his presence, whether it be pornography, jealousy, envy, hatred, no matter what it is. Get rid of it. Because if we don't, we become a slave to those things. And it will control and eventually ruin your life, which is the opposite of the gospel. Jesus came to set us free. So we need to walk in that freedom. Amen, guys? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, and we praise you, Lord, that your word, Lord, is so convicting. But Lord, 
we just ask, Lord, that you help us to put this word into practice, to look in the mirror and say, I blew it. But I know that your grace is sufficient, Lord, and uh, your spirit is within me, Lord, and I can and I will conquer these things, Lord, that are controlling my life. For you, you, Lord, you are a rock and a fortress. You are a healer. You are a provider. You are our everything. Without you, we are nothing. We can't do anything that's of spiritual and eternal value, Lord. So help us, Lord, to practice this word. Help us to instill it in our homes, at our workplace, at our jobs, Lord. Let the Spirit, Lord, lead us and guide us. Help us to keep our emotions, Lord, under control when we feel like we're losing. Forgive us, Lord, for our mistakes. And help us to slowly but surely grow in you. In Jesus' name, amen.